Welcome back. A special mystery guest. Jessica, you're our special mystery guest. We wanted to have an episode to talk specifically about conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And the reason we wanted to talk about conflict resolution is because there's so many Mm -hmm. people that lack this skill in... In general. Yeah. I was going to say in corporate America, but yeah, yeah, you're right. In general. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like when it comes to coming into an uncomfortable discussion where conflict is at the core of the discussion, a lot of people just don't have this skill to work through it. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got people that, some people will just say, it's not worth it. I'm, I'm just not going to engage. And they, they yield. And other people say, it's a matter of principle. I'm not going to let go. And they dig in, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got a whole spectrum of that going on in the workplace, right? So we've seen that. We've, I'm sure we've been on teams where we've seen this happen. Sure. So it's a very topical thing to discuss, I think, conflict resolution. I can remember a situation specifically where we had a scaled retrospective and we had leadership involved and they were getting very aggressive and using one of our scrum masters as a scapegoat, which that's what it seemed like in the meeting. And I was acting as the scrum master and what? I had a very difficult time. Was that person in the meeting? How to mediate that conversation. Yeah, you were too. Was it? Yeah. I would look at the audience carefully for retrospectives, right? They, they should be for the team, by the team. Well, no, so this was a scaled one, right? So we have one for the team, and then they wanted to do one, like our CEO. He's like, yeah. that would be beneficial. Let's let's do a, like a reflection. And he really liked retrospectives. So we did it at that level as well. I don't remember this at all. I, are you I'm so the, sorry. Like, you I didn't even give me feedback afterwards. Did I? Yes. My memory is so <laughs> terrible. I, honestly, no, I can't remember. Yeah. Well, so you you want me to tell you what you told me? Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because during the situation, I have no it was comfortable. You could feel it. You know, the scrum master was getting defensive. So I interjected as far as like, we got to go within our time box. Like, we, we got to stay on track here. Right. What I could have done was communicate why we're here, communicate a working agreement. There was other things I could have done to mediate that conversation. Remind everyone that we're on the same team. We have the same goal in mind. Things that's of that true. nature. Yeah, that's good. But, you know, when I was on the spot like that, those things didn't come to me, right? So I tried to redirect the the conversation as best as I could but the feedback I got afterwards was that if I had more experience as like an agile coach because I'm I was a scrum master I still am if I had more experience as an agile coach I would know how to better navigate that conflict mm. but you know in that moment my fight or flight kicked in too I wasn't the, yeah, right. that wasn't directed so, yeah. at me yeah, right. yeah, yeah but I, it kicked in and so when that yeah. happens and your frontal cortex shuts down yeah. you don't think clearly yeah lizard brain takes over yeah yeah right yeah, yeah. I probably put it the way that you you just put it, which wasn't the great greatest way to put it. But the, the better way to put it was, if you're the facilitator of that session, then yes, everyone is looking to you to be like, hey, disarm this tense moment, turn it into whatever it needs to be turned into to make it more beneficial to everyone, and and then move us along in the agenda. That right. like that's a. Ooh, if you're talking about the magic of a scrum master, that's the magic is like, hey, I'm going to disarm the super tense moment of like, hey, you guys failed. We talked about this before, failing a sprint goal. Oh, yeah. You, like, don't you tell the development team they failed in something. Super dirty word, failed, right? Because mm. just the attack in that word of like, you failed. Yeah. You're a failure. That is a major insult, right? Your failure, Ohm. You failed. Like that's it's, it's small now. You know, as a developer. There's right? a better way to convey that other than the product person being like, This sprint was a failure. You're you got, shaming the team. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But the product person might not be trying to say, You guys messed up and I'm real disappointed in you. It might be, hey, it, it, the the message coming across might be We didn't do what we set out to do. Now let's stop for a second and introspect and figure out what went wrong so the next sprint we can commit to the goal and do what we're gonna let's really stop and think about what we did because nobody's holding us accountable this is us holding ourselves accountable to figure out how we learn from this misstep I didn't even want to say messed up because even like even that could be construed in the wrong way but it's all that kind of stuff but like rolled into somebody moderating the conversation to say like how do we learn from this 
did, all that rolls back into conflict resolution. It, it certainly does. And one of the things you could do in that specific situation, and I'll come back to yours after that, right, is obviously don't use the F word, you failed, or certainly don't use the you either, right? Yeah. I, I might say as a product owner, I might say this sprint was pretty good. However, we could have done better, right? So let's talk about some of the reasons why we didn't do as well as we expected. Mm -hmm. There's always we in there and not you, first of all. Mm. And ask the questions. Mm. Don't say, well, yep. if only our CICD worked, we, we might have met the goal. Yeah, yeah. No, right? Don't do that. Don't immediately go to a cause. Let them come up with these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to yours. Okay, so in a situation where you find yourself in the moment having to like come up with something, you can always turn to a break. Always turn to a break. Just say, this is a good point to take a break. Just stay five minutes and we'll come back. How's that? And actually remove yourself from the room physically. Just walk out, right? Because that'll give you the clarity of mind. If you're standing there, you're looking at the person who is the aggressor in this case, mm -hmm. or you're looking at everybody else looking at you saying, help defend us, right? Yeah. That doesn't help because your brain is still now in that fight or flight mode. Yeah. So if you get yourself out of the room, it gives you a breathing, you know, like a little bit of space where you can now think through and say, how can I deal with this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's always the option that you take a break. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad idea. I think in our in this case, it was the end of the meeting, okay. right? It was like the last five minutes of the meeting. It would be weird to take a break at that time. Sure, right? sure, I understand, yeah. But I hear what you're saying, absolutely. I think another thing I could have done in retrospect was schedule a one-on-one -on -one with the person who was pointing fingers. Yeah. You know, right. create a safe space for him and me, just the two of us, to right. kind of dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, And that's uncomfortable to do, too. It is, but, you know, at the same time, you really don't want to fuel the fire. What I'm saying is, when they're being that way, questioning and so forth, almost in an accusatory tone, mm -hmm. you don't want to necessarily start defending yourself right you say oh no but because now what's going on is now they're going to keep to their guns and now you've got into this firefight you don't yeah. want to do that yeah but it's like uh, graciously pull out of there yeah but to echo what, what jessica just said for a second it's like oh when you're in that mode where like it's like, ooh, full finger pistols like beep, beep, mm -hmm. beep, taking it offline to say hey let's talk about this offline let's put off the side Let's continue with on the main line or whatever and to, to get to whatever resolution and to take a note and to take that offline and have one on one. Woo boy, what a powerful tool. Because I have to think of it like from from the perspective of again, we're we're in the perspective of a small company here where you like have access to the C level executives and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to take an issue offline and talk to the technology people, talk to the business people, talk to the whatever one-on-one -on -one to get each of their perspectives. Now you understand each of their perspectives individually at a deep level. And when you meet back with them one-on-one, -on -one, you can take everyone's different perspective into account. So if I recommend anything to people trying to break in, like people, I think of people trying to break in the field, people that are scrum master for the first time and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, one-on-one -on -one is basically where you make all your money is having one-on-ones with people. That's your opportunity to influence and to spread your organizational influence is one-on-ones. You, you, you spread influence one-on-one -on -one, and then when everyone's together combined, you have already planted the seeds throughout Absolutely. It's a force multiplier yeah. when everybody's together. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. One-on-ones are very, very powerful for sure. Mm -hmm. We got on this topic because we were talking about conflict resolution and we were talking about places that it was uncomfortable because everyone in the organization, it's basically uncomfortable for it. I, I remember when I was a team lead for uh, just to pick one out of the air. I, this is probably not even the best example. When I was a team lead on a QA team, I remember my boss... Not, this is not a ding on him because my boss was excellent at the time. Uh, my, my boss not wanting to go to war with the development manager over certain things. Mm -hmm. So it was like he, he was avoiding conflict right. of like, well, well, we just got, well, he just wants this and we just got to do it because, you know, because uh, otherwise this and that and this and that. And, you know, he just wasn't looking to get into a deeper fight. Yes about certain things. And then I, as a team leader, I was like, oh, I'll certainly get into a deeper fight because I, I think it's very important. But he was, 
sort of leveraging both the, the, the like the work and the QA team's contributions to the larger organization. But at the same time, he knew we had to live in the world of working with development every day. Mm. So th there were certain fights that he w that he was willing to lose and that he was willing to stick it out and win in. And uh, he mm. kind of made that decision on my behalf as a team leader, which as a team leader kind of annoys you at the time because you're like, I, well, I want to fight every fight on my own. But that's, I mean, that's, that's just the world you live in. So it's like there are certain fights that he would avoid and there are certain fights that he would get in. But that doesn't mean yeah. that that Picked doesn't battles. That does not mean that he was just conflict avoidant, which certain people in the organization certainly are. Oh yeah. Yeah. They just they just will avoid conflict. And sometimes you see those people continuing to get elevated in their career because of that. They didn't ruffle anyone's feathers. <sighs> Oh, I'm taking it away. <laughs> <laughs> you really want me to do I that? I can't. I can't get into this one. <laughs> yeah, you, you're right. Some people get up and advance in that way, but unfortunately, that doesn't serve your teams well because I, they're not gonna pick the fight that needs to be fought. If you're, if they're always just gonna back down. But they're well liked. You know. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. well liked, and, and they're an personally doing well, uh, right? Some, like, personally, they're doing okay because they're getting raises right? or advanced uh, or sure. whatever. I would argue, just for my my own career perspective the people who say yes i was gonna say yes and just to be pedantic <laughs> but i'm not gonna do that the people who just say yes and don't follow it up with anything a lot of them do get ahead over and above the people who are like oh let's talk about this and let's talk about that and let's weigh both sides or whatever the people who just say oh yeah we can do that and then kind of pass that pain along to the team or whatever. This is what I was saying. That sure. They don't. Uh, yeah, they yeah. do well by the team. Yeah, right? because that's what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, but from being a team member, I know that the team, everybody on the team knows that that's happening. Everyone on the team knows that, like, you have a team lead or a lead developer or some a senior developer or whatever. They're just a yes man or a woman, I guess. Although I, I don't think I've ever been on a team with a yes woman. Usually it's been a yes man. That's not what this podcast is about. So I'm, I'm going to abandon this topic. <laughs> yeah, so those people are well liked only by people on the periphery, not the team, to his point, right? The team knows that this person is always making commitments mm -hmm. and simply shifting the blame on us when those commitments can't be met. Yeah. So they're not well liked by the team necessarily, but they're well liked by those on the periphery and maybe above because they're hearing the answers they want to hear. All right. So how do you stay true to yourself, look out for the team, and respectfully say no? Well, no is a shorter word than yes, so it mm -hmm. should come more naturally to say no. I'd say just always have the interests of the team at heart, so, but don't say no in all situations. You can say no without using the word no, right? Always use the opportunity cost argument too. Just say, if we were to do that, what are we not doing? Yeah. Right. Mm. That gets people to think about the alternate. That's Be good. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. What pain would it cause us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can do this from a product perspective mm -hmm. because I, I will say no to the people I have the ability inside the organization to say no to because I'll just tell them no. No, we're, we're not. We're, that's not a high priority. We got these other things. They're a higher priority. And no. You know what I mean? Other people I might be more graceful with to be like, that's in the backlog. It's it's not come up to be something that we've refined yet, but we but it is in our on our roadmap to deal with. Other people might need more grace to deal with. Mm. Where I tell them this potential feature, there's different personas that we could implement it for. I have to think about who we're going to implement it for before we do it in production. Mm. And, and, and that's how I'll tell them no. But basically, no, as in not yet, because we haven't thought deep enough about it. Yeah. That kind of no. You know what I mean? Uh, but people I can tell no, no, like a hard no, no to, I will tell them no as a product person. I'll be like, no, we're not doing that. There's no money in that. It would take the team too much to deal with that. W w let me flip to the other side. I'm going to tag you in. Um, well, like a flip to the other side of the house, the scrum master side of the house. I'm, I'm totally cutting to the end of this. Oh. S flipping to the scrum master side of the house. What is the product equivalent of that? Because yeah. I, I am willing to go all the way up to the executive level with my like hard no on certain things. 
because I have users behind it. I have other roadmap features behind it. I have, I, because I'm me, it's not just anecdotal. I have actual experiments that we've done and data to back it up. Yeah, I'll give you a real example from the Scrum Master side of the house then. Yeah. So let's say, let's say somebody, doesn't matter who really, uh -oh. says that uh, let's go to three week sprints. How about four? How Our about developers aren't able to deliver things to testers soon enough so the testers can get everything done in two weeks. Two weeks is just not working for us, right? Yeah. right? So that's an example us. where the Scrum Master needs to take a stand, right? The yes person would probably say, okay, but what There's if less the yes, for me to do. The yes person is the superior to the Scrum Master. It doesn't matter. It doesn't it, matter. No, because the Scrum Master is the person who is the expert on process, and it's their role to coach up in the organization. What if so their superior is the Agile coach? It's uh -oh. their role to coach yeah, up. Are we on a conflict resolution right now yeah, that I have to are. step into? <laughs> like, about, there's uh, a trifecta happening in, in this discussion. We, it, uh, unless we include the leadership, and then there's a... What's a four a four factor? What's four that? Factor. I don't even understand. Like quadrifecta. Quadrifecta. That's not even a real thing. I'm editing all this out. There, there's the dev team members. There's a scrum master who's representative of the process. And then there's a product person that's included in this. So like there are multiple voices in this. Mm -hmm. So like anybody like <laughs> laying down a, a dictate to be like, no, no, no. To answer your retort, which was, which is what is happening now. I would first include all the rest of the voices in that discussion to be like, wait a minute. I understand you're saying this needs to happen, but like, mm -hmm. let's figure out if the, like, it does, is this optimal for product? Is this optimal for the dev team members? And like, maybe everyone backs down because they don't want to deal with a, with one person who's the highest paid person in the room or the most loudest screaming person, like that yeah. kind of thing, yeah, that yeah. kind of situation. I almost want to stop right now and let you continue where you, because you were coming to a point that was very important and I, I kind of like cut in front of it. I think you've actually tried to reinforce it. So yeah, bring everybody into the conversation yeah, first right, of all. Yeah. And then try and pivot the issue away from just what is being presented as the problem. We can't do development and testing in two weeks, right? right? Therefore, the answer is add an extra week to the sprint. Like, how do you stretch from that to this? So what are the alternatives? Mm. What else can we do? Yeah. So have that conversation. And then to Brian's point, is this optimal for the product? I mm -hmm. might ask the question, would it be okay for the business to not see anything for three weeks? Absolutely and give not. give us feedback. Right? Absolutely not. Exactly. I, 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 absolutely not. And also get out of the room and also like take some vacation and come back when you're ready to talk about sane topics. Exactly. I can't go more than two weeks without talking to a customer. Get out of my office. Back it up with something like this, right? Just say, so if we went to three week sprints, it takes three weeks before we show the business something and get feedback. And let's say we have to pivot, right? Mm. So it takes us a little bit of time to pivot and then another three weeks go by, right? So let's say six weeks, let's say it takes us only a minute or two to pivot, right? So, so three weeks, get feedback, another three weeks because we now went down the pivot that was suggested. Yep. So that's six weeks, that's a month and a half. That's way too long to go without feedback. We need frequent feedback. And for that reason alone, three week sprints is not a good idea. Uh, now, at the same time, and I would probably phrase it differently, but I would ask those team members that are pushing for the three weeks, what makes you confident that you can deliver in three weeks that which you cannot in yeah. two weeks, right? Yeah. Can we slice our stories vertically a little bit so we can get things done faster and get them to death? That's the answer, not three, because our stories are big and they remain big. So. In, in a few sprints, they'll come back to you and say, three's not working for us. Can we go to four? Mm. Right? Yeah. All I was thinking was <laughs> how uh, this is a totally different topic. So if you want to cut this out, feel free. We can nope. discuss this at a different time. Nope. We but like how uh, the, the certification to become a, a scrum master does not prepare you for the real role. This is like the events. You learn about the events as a scrum master. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, 10% of the role is the events because realistically you're navigating conversations like you just said uh -huh. and you can't learn that from the scrum guide no you cannot you have to be in the room to learn that right mm -hmm. i mean how else do you learn that you can listen to podcasts like us arguing. you also need some experience you do I need mean, the experience you yeah need that. yeah i agree with you there until now we were talking about why 
what and kind of why at the same time. And like you just segued us into the who. Like there are people in the organization, corporate America specifically, when I talk about who, there are people who have natural talent in the organization for what we're talking about now. A natural talent for mediation, natural talent for reiterating people's points and and bringing them up in a different way that's not so incendiary. But uh, that skill, that ability, I I don't really know where it lives in in the traditional corporate structure. Like I I would hope that it lives in HR somewhere. You know, that, that's why when, when people have brought up in the past, oh, where should Scrum Masters sit organizationally? And I'm like, well, they should sit under HR. And people are like, Brian, you're crazy. I'm like, well, I mean, am I crazy? Because the people in the organization that have these skills, they're more aligned under HR than anybody else. They're more aligned to saying, like, let me align opinions between people. Let me build consensus. Let me de-escalate conflict and then escalate it back up to what is beneficial to the organization. Like, who trains in these skills? It is not in the technical wing of the organization. Not at all. Absolutely not. No, they don't learn this stuff anywhere. It's not that you go to school to learn this stuff, right? I... Unfortunately, Scrum Masters, the Agile Coaches, I mean, we all report into the technical side of the house. Right. Whereas, to your point, HR they learn these soft skills as part of their job maybe right they do they do maybe no they do some are better at it than others Mm -hmm. right maybe but they take size so here's the other thing that happens today oh i'll I'll have a knife fight are we gonna get a knife fight i've done very poorly by hr exactly like listen that like i agree with you but i'm i'm not cutting any of this out i agree with you but only in so far such a great phrase. In o- so far as. Only in so far as. The, you, like the HR people in the HR, or if we're in the UK, HR, HR. people <laughs> people are not like specifically the hatchet men of the C-suite. Like they, they're not the like armed combatants of the C-suite. They actually are meant to serve the organization. But if they're that traditional role of there, they're only there to execute. On, on literally on, execute yeah, yeah. literally execute but like when we need to fire people yeah i'm not talking about those people okay <laughs> it is what it is folks people that are actually coming through shrm or whatever it is right these people are certified and edu- they're educated in the art of hr they, they're not there just to take a spreadsheet and go ah these ones are red fire these people i'm talking about people that have the soft skills to have negotiation skills to have discussions with people and it doesn't have to be technical people either it could be anybody so there's some element of that now to your point i've seen it done very poorly Mm -hmm. and what's worse is i've seen middle managers that are not in hr go to hr with an edict basically and say we need to fire this person they're not a they're not a team player Mm-hmm. Right and now, the HR person doesn't really have. They they should do the due diligence, but they don't. Should. They take the directive of yeah, we need to get rid of this person. They call them in and they do the exit interview, right? But that's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about real mm-hmm. facilitation skills where they can be brought in, and listen to their side of the story, and see if their skill set could be leveraged somewhere else. Maybe they're not in the right place in the right role in the organization, but they have skills. Maybe they can be deployed somewhere else in the organization, right? Look at alternatives like that. No, that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately, because you know we, we work in large companies that are largely like matrixed, and that's where you get the middle manager going straight to HR saying, get rid of this person. Mm. So that's where it all falls apart for me. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Well, I wanna give you guys another hypothetical. Sure. What if you're in a meeting with all of your peers and you are, say, blatantly disrespected, Uh undermined, talked over, Uh whatever, fill in the blank, right? How do you respond in the meeting? How do you respond outside of the meeting? So if somebody is deliberate, somebody or somebody's, are they deliberately undermining you in this meeting? Sure. A peer, a, a member of a team, a somebody in a supervisory level like what 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 so do they we would, they would change huh so say in this instance it's another peer we'll start with that and then we'll go to superior because i want to hear the difference too mm. yeah i mean if they're undermining you 
you know, your opinions, right? Are they still giving you airtime? Are, are they letting you speak? Because if they're not letting you speak, you would behave a different way. Mm-hmm. Then if you're able to speak, then it's up to you to make your point, basically, right? Because you've got the airtime you need in the room. But if they're not letting you speak, I would simply just do this. Raise your hand and, and say nothing. Just raise your hand. Let them speak. Let, let them just talk it out. Whatever they have to say, they have to stop at some point, take a breath. Somebody else in the room might clue on that and say, Jessica, you have something to say, right? That's the clue. That Now you go in and you say, yes, if I can finish my thought for a couple of minutes now. I don't agree with this because. And now you can get your point across. And, and that is not disrespecting the person who is, you know, yeah. who's doing this to you. That is simply using the room yeah. to get your time slice to talk. Mm-hmm. yeah all right you could always use the shaman stick thing as well right well uh, yeah you could and then after the meeting you would go to this individual one-on-one yeah after the meeting you would you would go to this individual one-on-one and again you shouldn't go in there with the intention of locking horns with them mm-hmm. m- tempting as it might be sure. right you would go in there and say i, I firmly believe in what I said. Now, now, think about what I just said. I didn't say, I believe you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Don't use the you word. Mm-hmm. Right? I believe I'm right because. Right? And then let them make their position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how would you start the conversation by like discussing what the goal may be having some like casual verbal working agreement, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean one-on-one or? Well, in yeah, the, in a yeah, one-on-one. In a one-on-one. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you would say well, the reason why we're in these roles is what we're trying to do is, and we're on the same side. Yeah, we're on the same side. We're trying to do things. You, we're seeing two sides of a coin, right? And this is why I believe we should do things this way, and let them make their point. Sure. What if they get defensive? That's fine. That's their prerogative, right? Mm-hmm. They can get defensive. They can. They might even get really like aggressive too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right but if they get defensive they de- are they defending their position if they're defending their position at some point you have to decide how far are you willing to take this right yeah and you can just say the, the classic thing is we'll have to agree to disagree this time yeah i was trying to say out of this one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also it's different from a scrum master as a coach like team level perspective than from a product perspective because i i think of this topic from a product perspective, this happens all the time to me, which is, should we put money into building this product or that product or this feature or that feature? And product manager A for team A will say, oh, we should build this because I think this. And product manager B for team B will say, well, I think we should build this for team that. And then they could dis- you know, they could agree to disagree basically in that meeting. But from a product perspective, I, if we're conflicted about a path to take, well, then we need to do an experiment to figure out which path to take, to figure out where we get signal from, to, to figure out which path to take, mm-hmm. right? Because if we don't have any signal, we can, we can go to path A, path B, path whatever, Z or Z. Hmm. If like, you're customer driven, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. easy to do. If, if we're a UK customer driven, path Z. Z. Uh, then uh, there's a million paths we can take. But like, uh, why don't we try something and see if we get some signal from it. And then based on the signal, we'll make an informed decision. Right? Like the, the, those are the, we can have those discussions between myself and her self. I don't know if that's a, is that proper English? Myself and herself or myself, myself and, and her? her? Is yeah, it myself yeah. and her? Yeah. English language. There's going to be a lot of editing in this podcast. Well, her and I, if you want to be proper. <laughs> her and I. There's a lot of back and forth discussion between her and I. We'll decide based on the evidence that we discover which path to take. And then there are no bruised egos mm. in there because we, because we both agree. Hey, let's try something and whatever yields a result then we'll do that. And we're both on the same page of like, oh, well, well, we tried and then we figured it out based on based on what we got back. I will tell you honestly, usually it's a it's it's sort of a, a mix or it's usually something that neither of us 
thought about in the first place. It's, it's that evidence-based yeah. approach, though, right? It's hard yeah. to argue against yeah, that. Yeah. It's, it's logic. Yeah, or, uh, uh, but you were talking about team-based stuff. I pivoted to product-based stuff because uh, to try to emphasize, for anyone who's listening to this podcast, to try to emphasize, like, the team-based stuff is just evidence-based with different evidence. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it might seem more difficult to get that evidence of the of the team based approach of like well we should we do this with the teams or should we do, should we do that with the teams, but I mean, is it really that difficult it or you, or have you just not tried to measure different things yeah. organizationally? Yeah, it's the latter usually. Right? Yeah, usually it's the latter. Yeah. you haven't really dug deep enough, right? I would say though, if you're looking at picking up some tips, I guess in how to react in situations where the other person is badly That's not att- not a, not necessarily well verbally attacking you sure let's yeah. say right verbally uh, attacking j- just you. watch just watch a little bit of the uh, parliament time in the british parliament oh. watch these people these politicians go at each other mm-hmm. they attack each other all the time never do they call anybody a bad name or anything you know it's the right honorable gentleman doesn't know which side of his head he's talking about yeah, that, right. that might be extreme <laughs> But you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, so I've, I've not insulted him. I've called him yeah, yeah. the right honorable, yeah, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. at the same time, it, it's an art form. But it really is. But they're, they're not letting anything fly. Of like course they're, not. They're like, uh, they, 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 the, this is why I brought up the product thing. If someone tells me, oh, 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 Brian, the majority of customers don't want to click uh, this button first to, before they see their report. What proof do you have? of the majority of customers want to see that, yeah, that, like, that show me show me the evidence of that you you know what i mean like uh, th- that would be the, the the parliamentary equivalent of like uh, show me what evidence you have that backs up your claim of xyz i feel only because i'm in the product space can i say you should lead with that you should lead with your evidence you should know. do that in, uh, even on the scrum yeah scrum well, uh, side. yeah but it's it's, it. it's i i think it's harder to do on the scrum master side it's harder but than not it impulsive. is on the product side harder but not impulsive funny yeah I, I wrote down something can scrum masters be assertive <laughs> that's all yeah that's here can scrum masters just say no like this this goes back to our super early podcast about meet them where they are oh, yeah. like meet them oh well you got to just meet them where they are because maybe they don't know anything about Scrum and maybe they're kind of doing things all messed up and you guys kind of got to meet them where they are. Like, oh, I no. mean, or do you, <laughs> do you got to meet them where they are? No, you don't. You don't like where they are. I, mean, I don't like where they are. Usually. We only, we only have, we only have 25 minutes to do a retrospective. Do you really need to meet them where they are? Is 25 minutes enough to, like, I, I, I constantly tell people, I was like, 25 minutes is not even enough to generate ideas and put them on the board and group them. I know teams that <sighs> just tick a box and say, we'll just stack on 15 minutes and do a retro at the end of our stand-up. Most certainly. Whoa. Oh, yeah. 15 yeah. minutes is all I we know. need. That's right. Wow. And there's usually... How fruitful is that conversation? Not, not very... It, it, like, it's expeditious because Scrum Master just says, okay, we'll start the retro now. What went well? I like the fact that Johnny helped me out. Oh, yeah. great. Well done, Johnny. Kudos. What didn't work so well? Silence. Right? No feedback. No feedback. Uh, you know, what can we do better? 90 points Nothing. carried over, guys. Are you sure? Nothing <laughs> went, didn't go well? Huh? Then they get into the blame game <laughs> as soon as that happens. Right. Well, because I mean, the environment was down. I mean, someone, someone, sure. ha- like, someone has to take ownership for it. What does the scrum have to draw a line in the sand about and say, no, 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 no. No, you, you can't have hour-long daily scrum meeting like where's the line in the sand like i like some people be like oh brian you're like what are you talking about like if the team needs to have hour-long daily stand-ups who are you to say yeah those people are the same people that say we don't have to do things up by the scrum guide it's whatever works for the team so so of course the minute you do that you're not following scrum and then when it doesn't work you go well scrum doesn't work for us you're not doing scrum that's the problem like the 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 trade-off to that is people who will say well my daily scrum is 10 minutes of daily scrum actual daily. hey i'm gonna work on this today oh you're working on that okay whatever and then the follow-up discussion is all of the stuff that 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 has slipped between the cracks of like 
things that we didn't do in refinement, things we didn't do in sprint planning. Oh, like we shortcutted our sprint. This is this is a big thing with me. If you shortcut your sprint planning, and you you're like, oh, my sprint planning is only forty five minutes. Okay, cool. Forty five minutes sprint planning. This is what we're gonna work on, or whatever. And then you end your sprint planning. And the first day your sprint begins and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to implement any of these things. Well, that time that you should have spent sprint planning. Now, every day you're going to have to spend a fraction of it along when the sprint is happening to plan each item as it comes up. So every Monday, whatever day your sprint begins, every Monday you can spend four hours, six hours, whatever it is, and plan every task in depth. Or every other day, your dev team can be meeting an hour in the morning doing a little micro sprint planning, but you don't really realize that's what they're doing as part of their daily scrum. This, what we're talking about, falls in that category. Mm -hmm. You know, of the scrum master saying, no, 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 we're not done with sprint planning. You guys you haven't have all your tasks. You, you haven't done all your subtasks. You haven't talked about what what is touched in each story. You haven't specked out how you're going to build it. You don't have an architecture laid out. You don't have you know what I mean all, all that kind of stuff. You haven't finished this stuff. Sprint planning's not over. Sure. So the scrum master in that example is reinforcing how to do things properly in scrum. Mm -hmm. yeah, basically, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not doing that, let's like say you're not doing scrum. So should the scrum master say no? Absolutely. Yeah. I remember hearing one of our managers say this. He was an agile coach. Yeah, so he yeah. would say maybe. He would be very assertive. His personality was to be assertive. And then he would stop thinking. He's like, maybe. <laughs> he would follow it up with a maybe. Because he didn't want to come across too assertive in his role as, I guess he was playing a, a scrum master more so in that instance. And I can understand it, right? If you come off too assertive, you can come across like a project manager and you'll lose the respect of your team because that's uh, not what you're there I think it for. depends on the maturity of your team though, right? If, if they're not doing the basics right, then it's entirely okay to say, this is how we should be doing things. I mean, that's you basically coaching the team. Sure, when it comes to process, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. anything outside of the process, maybe out of a maybe? <laughs> sure, if you're really not sure. <laughs> Maybe. Huh? I don't know. Like this, this, uh, this walks a real weird line with me because, again, this goes back to like the early podcasting about meet them where they are. What if they're in a place where they're doing 15 minute retrospectives and a 20 minute sprint plannings? You know that they're not doing an appropriate amount of planning. Yeah. You know at the end of the planning event, they're not getting out of the planning event with what they should. And when the conversation is organizationally, when the conversation is torn, turned towards, oh, I don't really think Scrum works for us. Mm. Like now you're in the, mm -hmm. now you're targeted. You've made yourself a target. I've now taken the subject of conflict resolution and turned it around <laughs> for this conversation right. because that, now I'm going to create conflict to say, listen, like th these are the things that I own. Like uh, it, again, going back to my all time thing of like, you're not a Scrum master, you're the process owner. And if you're the process owner, you have to say, we didn't figure out these things that we were supposed to figure out in this event, the sprint planning event, what, back of refinement, whatever mm -hmm. retrospective. We didn't figure these things out because we didn't spend enough time. Right. I, I'm taking offline that the idea of the moderation, right? Like you've moderated the topic appropriately and stuff like that. If you, if you don't have enough time, forget moderation. Yeah. If you don't have enough time, the bare bones framework of time, there's not a lot you can do as a facilitator instead of that time box. We're here on arguing agile. I'm going to argue this. All right. So say you're plopped into a team. They're doing this process. You're against meeting them where they are. So would you say like, hey, I'm changing these meetings. Would you even tell them or would you just change it? Just change all the meetings to the way that you know would be most effective and they'll just deal with it. Is that your approach? Isn't that disruptive? I you might uh, make some enemies. I, You're I, new here. I, I don't like being yelled at, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> but I do this currently because my sprint review is slightly truncated to less than what I would like. <laughs> I know you, you like the word truncated. I, I, I threw that I one in there for that. you. 
Did I say that last time? I, you did it in a previous podcast. You were like, I love the word truncated. I do. Oh, it's, it's such, such a, a good it's word. such a developer word. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to go back to this right, uh, that we just touched on, right? Mm-hmm. Would you just change the meetings or would you tell your teams, right? That was mm-hmm. your question. Mm-hmm. So f- my approach would be to say to the team, for this particular meeting, the recommendation is this many hours or whatever it is right so let's say let's say sprint planning so for a two-week sprint this, you should be spending of the order of four hours you could get done early but you have to come out of it with these things yeah and therefore we're going to meet for four hours yeah and, and change it but i've told them why right so when they come in you they know why. The why yeah yeah and i put it in the agenda too it's important you know. for people to understand the why it is i was just having this conversation with my my current boss and he's like, I know you, Jessica. I know you always challenge me. He's like, and I appreciate it because, you know, you need to understand the why behind what we're doing for you to be on board with it. Awesome. Like, I yeah. think teams are the same way. They are. Yeah, I think you're going to get their buy-in so much more effectively or easily even, mm-hmm. right, if they understood the why. Mm-hmm. And you tell them these are the outcomes that we're looking for from this meeting. If we can do those in less than four hours, we don't have to stay on the call. Yeah. But we have to meet them. If you can do it in less then great. But uh, the team should be booked off for that amount of time. It's kind of like a mechanic. It it takes four hours to do the servicing. I'm going to book four hours for it. If you can get done earlier than that and then move on to other things, great. But we should reserve that time on their calendar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go back into conflict? We were talking about, can the Scrum Master say no? Scrum Master, Agile Coach, basically the person in charge of the process, can they say no? I mean, you always consider the project manager, a project manager to be more authoritative, right? So the Scrum Master takes a different approach. They're more influential, right? Maybe to your point that they have to explain the why behind something. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think they do have to explain the why, mm-hmm. but I still think that there are situations when they need to be assertive, mm-hmm. say no when no is warranted, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they are the process expert, right? The teams are not necessarily so. They may be opinionated, of course, and that's okay. This is where the Scrum Master skills come in, where you listen to somebody, you offer a contrarian view, you listen to somebody else, hopefully someone sides with your views in the team, and kind of listen and mm. juxtapose one against the other, but steer the conversation towards the decision you've already made. And you've explained that by explaining mm. the why. And last but not least, I like this part, you could say, well, how about we do this? Let's just try this for a sprint. Mm-hmm. So experiment, right, mm. and see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always that. Brian, you're making a face. What are your thoughts? I am making a face. <laughs> I, I tend to think if a team is lucky enough to have a Scrum Master, or if you don't have some kind of shared Agile coach, yeah. if you're lucky enough to have a Scrum Master, like they should know the rules. I, I know when I, like it's not a super popular way to say it, like they should know the rules. Like there's these are them's the rules, them's the bricks. Like follow them or not, they should have the expertise to say this is the way the Scrum events should be performed. These are the proper time boxes. Like, for example, at the sprint review, you should be getting customer feedback. Like, if there's no customers at your sprint review, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Mm. I, as a scrum master, you need to point out that's a problem. Mm. Okay. If you're pointing out these things and uh, you're getting pushback, nobody cares. I can think of a, a bunch of bad ways to present it. I'm not trying to present it in a bad way. I'm just trying to say, if the organization is is inclined to not take what you're saying into consideration on the last podcast before you got here jessica we were like what if you bring up like a, a good question is like, we want to we want to invest in feature a and someone's like well who is the user mm. for feature a because we want to get feedback if we build this and then somebody who's sponsoring the feature is like i don't care what feedback we get yeah, we don't I need to build. ask the customer. We don't need to ask the customer. <laughs> I don't care about their mm-hmm. opinion. Oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah, who's the person to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would hope the product person would be like, sure. wait a minute. But I mean, it, yeah. I've been in a lot of organizations where the product person is not one to rock the boat. They're putting you, the scrum master, agile coach, whatever, 
in a very weird position at that point mm-hmm. to be like, wait a minute, if you don't care about the customer experience, like who does care about the customer experience? Yeah. It, it, that's a, that's a strange position to be put into. And I, I like, I only bring it up because it's, it's sort of in the banner of conflict resolution mm. because somebody in the organization is pushing, they're pushing real hard. Are they aligned with the best interests of the customer? They're probably aligned in the best interests of themselves. Yeah. I I would like to think you figure that out by asking a bunch of questions. You know, hey, what makes you think that your idea is the best way to go? What are we going to do to, to prove once we implement your idea that that was the best solution? Right. Okay. And the reason I have this weird expression on my face, Jessica, okay? The reason I have this weird expression is because there are organizations where that is just seen as, I don't know, stirring up trouble. Mm. I'm just looking to cause fights at that point. I'm going back to the topic of conflict resolution. I'm, I'm the product person and you're a random VP. Random VP. Every VP is a product person. <laughs> that's right. So that's my that's my throwing the gauntlet down challenge in this podcast. Every VP in the organization thinks they're a product person. They think that all their ideas are the greatest customer challenges and solutions. Okay. But not until you start implementing them and testing them do you find out what's true and what's not, right? So it it, it serves your organization to come up with some kind of methodology where you can test ideas before you fully implement them whatever that means it could be real heavyweight depending on the way your organization is set up we're going to do another podcast on that subject we've already planned one out good testing ideas nice but uh, you can get in some real vicious knife fights about like hey i think we should do this for these customers uh-huh. and then as a product person you can say what leads you to believe Mm. you know Mm -hmm. why are you questioning me Mm. just do what i say well they pull rank at that point sure they do you know but that happens like uh, like uh, the only reason i bring that up is like if there's anyone out there that's thinking i as a scrum master am caught in the middle of like the product people and the people that are bringing the ideas and the team or maybe the product in the team maybe you're stuck in the middle of the product in the team right do i have to always be the bigger person to be like hey why don't we think about how do we prove this idea or hey why don't i try to disarm this combo like the, the, this development manager is like oh just implement this because i say so like oh do i have to be the one all the time to say why do you think that's important what evidence leads you to believe that we need to implement this as a top priority as opposed to our other stuff? Especially if you're in an organization where the product person doesn't want to put themselves in front of the team to deflect that kind of stuff. And the scrum master is putting themselves in a position where they're like, let me be the neutral party kind of disarming both sides and bringing us to some kind of resolution. Because, again, going back to super early where we were talking about this subject is, like, they're the best person with those skills on the team. Right. Do they always have to be in that role? I think if your team is not mature where people are raising their hand to be that person who, who comes out and you yeah. know, disarms and whatnot, yeah. for whatever reason, maybe they have the skills. Maybe they just don't feel like it's their place or they're nervous mm, or whatever sure. it is, right? Yeah. Then the Scrum Master should be leading by example. But then after this is over, the Scrum Master could say, any one of you can do this. Feel free, feel empowered to mm. say something when you see something not being done right. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so, but yeah, the Scrum Master cannot just take a back seat in those situations because you'll get steamrolled. Sure, of course. I don't know how deep to, to, to drill into this topic. Let's say you're in a backlog refinement, for example, and you have a, a some, some kind of person that's in like a, a lead level or supervisory level to the team. So this is like a, like a, what were we talking about before? Like a solution architect or something, somebody like that, right? They say, oh no, you have to do this. And they're, they're really drilling down. It would be the scrum master to, to 
again, assuming your team members and or your product person is not interceding, saying, hey, how can we, how can we break this down and uh, come to some kind of consensus? <sighs> like putting this all in the scrum, I, I, I don't know. I, like, I, I'm kind of changing my opinion as we're going on with this podcast of like, it's kind of unfair to ask the scrum master to intercede on the team's behalf mm. and and say, hey, you're you're pushing real hard on this topic. Why don't we hear some other opinions? Yeah, you know? But if the scrum master doesn't do it and no one else has said anything, then, you know, the aggressor is going to get their way. Yeah. yeah. So then in that case, the scrum master should speak up and yeah. lead by example, I think. Yeah, it's a tough spot to put someone in, especially like we keep going back to all the time. It's like, oh, the scrum master, should they be technical or not? Or like if you're talking about a super deep technical issue being discussed between like the architect and the team, oh, you guys should be able to do this in one sprint. I don't understand what's so hard about it or whatever. The scrum master is going to insert themselves in that conversation. That's a, that's a, that's a tough conversation to crowbar yourself into the middle of. But it's an important conversation to do that in because otherwise the team feels pressured now to deliver that in one sprint or two sprints, Yeah. right? So the Scrum Master could at that point ask the question, right? Is this something that you've done before mm -hmm. in a sprint, right? Like what, may, again, to use your words, what makes you believe this can be done in a sprint? Yeah. I wouldn't phrase it that way. You know, I would just simply ask, right? Well, has this well, been done before? You're not taking my words then, because I totally would phrase <laughs> Yeah, you <that>. would. <laughs> but yeah, so I think the Scrum Master does need to inject themselves in the middle of this. And they don't have to be technical. They can be diplomatic. They can ask the team. They can say, the ask here from the solution architect is to do this work, whatever it yeah. is, in a sprint, right? Just give me a confidence level, fist to five. Yeah, you know, right, yeah. Go around the room mm -hmm. and ask people. Mm -hmm work out a quick average in your mind and say, we don't know if it can be done in a sprint. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we yeah. aim for two? And if it can be done in one, great. Yeah. I want to bring up another conflict situation. I think this one is probably pretty common. What do you guys do when product owners in instances might point fingers at the scrum master saying, maybe we're not as productive because of you guys. Maybe we're not delivering because of you. It's not our lack of requirements or their understanding of our requirements or even the late requirements we're uh -huh. bringing no 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 this is you mm. well how how would they what would be an example of paying a scrum master like i can't i can't like the, well they would be the scapegoat in this situation uh, oh, right yeah, so but, uh, business wouldn't be blaming product for not delivering not doing their job well it's that scrum master who's not a part of our group thoughts yeah, I mean, the whole thing starts when you use words like us and them, right? Yeah. So the product organization, the product owner is part of the team. Yeah. And I sometimes come across teams that speak like this within the team. They'll just say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, who's they? Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the business, the product owners. Well, yeah. they're part of the team, right? They're, it's us. There's no they. Yeah. I would have a conversation with the product owner who believes the Scrum Master is the reason why things aren't being delivered, right? Just ask for examples. Just say, give me some examples I'm looking to improve. How can I do better? Give me examples of where I've impeded the team from delivering. So what if that conversation is had and it's clear it's not anything that you were a part of, but the problem is how do you get other people to realize that? Because at this point, isn't the scrum master's reputation slightly tainted in the eyes and ears of these other people who heard this? No, I don't think so. I think the scrum master needs to have some pretty thick skin, right? Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. I would look at the history of the team, the delivery of the, what, what they've done, right? And say, given the capacity that the team has and given the information we have available, this is the, uh, what's the word? The, the prime directive, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. what this is. Given everything that we had at our disposal, we did the best job we could. And this is where we are, mm. right? Now, if you all have suggestions for making us more efficient, <laughs> right, or effective, I'm all ears. Are you having this conversation with a product owner or the product team at this point? The product team, oh, everybody. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Because like I said, if you had it with one person, say the product owner on your team, you got them to understand the situation. Right. Who's to say that goes back to the product team and the business, right? That's why I meant, isn't your name as a scrum master slandered by that point and your reputation? Maybe, but I wouldn't dwell on that. I, I would 
really address the product team mm -hmm. and help them understand how things work in Scrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the reputation. It will fix itself once the team becomes a smooth, well-oiled machine, right? That That's really your job as a Scrum Master. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think it's worth spending too much time thinking about the reputation of a Scrum Master necessarily. Now, having said that, if somebody's directly pointing that out to you from the product organization, then yeah, you need to have that conversation with them. Definitely. Hmm. What are your thoughts, Brian? You're awfully quiet. I don't I don't take kindly to people slandering my reputations. I would uh, I challenge them to a duel and uh, meet at high noon. Ten yeah, paces. meet at high noon. That's right. <laughs> it's a very strange position to be in. Like uh, like basically someone saying you're not doing your job. I don't know. I, I, I it's difficult for me because I, I don't live in that space anymore. So I, I, like, what evidence do you have that says? Well, I'll give you a hypothetical example. Oh, please. Right. So, for instance, I think I mentioned this earlier, if the product owner has continuously maybe changed requirements mid-sprint or sure. it wasn't clear enough later on as things were revised, right? And then there was a conversation around that, so it didn't make the deployment mm -hmm. that it was scheduled for originally because of the changes. So for them to come back and say, it was the Scrum Master, it was, it was you. Yeah, in this situation, if they really changed requirements or they were late or they weren't clear enough, I would basically conduct a retrospective with the team and put that on a board and display that to the product owners, specifically the people that are changing the requirements, and yeah. say, we did a retrospective on the root causes of why we didn't deliver as much as you're looking for, and these are the reasons the team came up with. So you're removing yourself from the situation sure. as a scrum master at that sure, point, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I would try that. Yeah, I mean, I would also think that if requirements are changed very late in the process, that you would be able to show that. You'd be able to show the metrics of that. The, the, hey, the team uh, took on five stories, and of those five stories that we took on the beginning of the sprint, out of those five, two, three were changed mid-sprint. I mean, you can't expect that like, when you start the sprint, you can't ex expect to change 60% of the scope of the sprint right? and and get what the team committed to in the beginning. You know, a, a, a three out of five would be 60%. Like a, when armed with real metrics and your organization is committed to talking about real metrics. Mm-hmm then they have to address the situation. But I, I say that like also ready to say I've been in a bunch of organizations where like you can bring metrics, but like they don't really matter. Like uh, opinions matter more than metrics in some organizations that I've been at where like uh, certain people's opinions are more important and more defensible. I mean, like this goes back to the 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 John Cotter leading changes. If you want something out of your organization, but you know some people are going to resist, you have to lay out the vision of your organization and communicate it to everyone. And the people that still resist, even though you've laid out the change in the organization, and they willingly like they're obviously resisting. You have to you have to either have a one on one with them and get them to change their behavior, or just cut them out of the organization. Okay, I think of this in the same vein as like, if you have people that are changing requirements, even when they're in the sprint, in mid sprint, changing AC, modifying behavior, changing basically the root of the story as this, I want this or whatever. Well, I don't want this anymore. I want this or whatever. Again, assuming it's not a team issue with like if they're starting to work on a story and it has no acceptance criteria well we'll just figure it out we'll figure the like mm -mm. that is on the team sure like yeah. not having an acceptance criteria it to tie to yeah ready we wouldn't take it but out. if you start the story and the product owner adds acceptance criteria as the story moves along either the team didn't spend enough time in planning to figure out all the exemption criteria and then split the story appropriately. Or the product person has 
added stuff mm -hmm. to the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, assuming they've added stuff to the story, though, it's an opportunity, though. I would see that as an opportunity yeah. to coach them. I mm -hmm. think so, mm -hmm. too, yeah. 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 Maybe yeah. they don't understand that things shouldn't change once the story starts. Well, well again, what if they say... This I understand, but business said this is imperative. This needs right. to be But then done. it's not a failure, right? <laughs> there, there's we've that. actually met the requirements of the business. Exactly. Yeah. So I would just turn it on, turn it to a positive. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, having been on the development side of this issue, I see both sides. Like, side number one is until we started working on it, we didn't know how deep mm. the issue went. Right. Yeah, sure. That that that's part of our learnings and our capabilities as sure. we learn. Yeah, as we work on things. the The other side of this is you shouldn't have committed to something if you didn't do the investigatory work to figure out how deep it went. Th right. th those are the two sides for this. I agree on both of those. Maybe on the first one, you should have considered the risk, right? Because you didn't know enough and right. sized it appropriately. Maybe just create a spike instead. These things can be changed, right? But assuming yeah. that it wasn't that from the team, the product owner actually changed the requirement, yeah. then that's a coaching moment right there. That's how it feels to change a tire when the car has been driven at 60 miles an hour. That, that, that's what the team feels. They have to scrap all the tests that they've written. They have to start again, basically, right? Mm. And that's why mm. it's, it's disruptive in a bad way. Let's go back to in conflict. I like it. Cool. So let's go back to the other hypothetical scenario. We were talking about peer to peer, right? What about peer right? So like, say you were disrespected in a meeting, something wasn't appropriately said, whatever. Something was was whoa, wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I like I want to cut in because there's different scenarios here. Which is number one, you're being openly disrespected. Uh -huh. Number two is a, like a superior in your organization, somebody who's your supervisor or whatever, is disagreeing with what you're saying. Those are different scenarios. So you, as my boss, are in a meeting and saying, oh, Brian, I think you're wrong. I, like The problem is not that we have 25-minute retrospectives. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. That is different than openly disrespecting you inside of a meeting. This came up for me recently. I don't know if I even want to leave this in the podcast, but uh, I told somebody recently, when I was a manager, there was a point in time when I was a QA manager when every employee in my group was uh, a woman. I was the only dude in, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's on the application, right? Dude, dude. woman, yeah. Um, like I was the only uh, man in the organization and every one of my employees was a woman. And uh, I would go to meetings, like sprint playing, that kind of stuff. And uh, if somebody would agree or segue on something that one of my employees were trying to question, just because I was in the meeting and it was my employee, I wouldn't let it go on first pass. Mm -hmm. I would I would reinforce their question so that it was discussed by the whole group, and it, it wasn't just uh, like shut down by one person. I make it seem like a male female thing, but it, it really was because I, I did that even when there were men on the team and women on the team. But it was a very male centric organization at that point. I don't even know why I'm going on this path. There's a book written on this about uh, women that worked in the Obama White House where they came up with a tactic where if a woman in the Obama White House would come up with an idea or a suggestion, when they brought up the suggestion, somebody else, that. yeah, yeah. Another the, woman would echo somebody it. Somebody else, yeah. it, it, just, just on principle, somebody else would echo it to make sure that it was heard and, and considered rather than immediately dismissed by the, the, the hierarchy that was male-dominated staff at the time. That like, Dismissed not on merit, but because it came from a woman. This goes back to the it's a good conflict. This goes back to the podcast we put aside for a second of talking about reinforcing ideas, like our ideas being heard. Why I brought this up was if you raise a point, question, and if that idea is basically dismissed out of hand, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there should be someone that says, hey, like, let's stop and let's explore that idea uh -huh. rather than dismiss it out of hand. You know, So an ally in the room, you're uh, saying, or should I, this be you? Ally in the room, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, well, should this be you if you're in the Scrum Master role, 
I kind of think it should. If you're in the Scrum Master role and literally anyone else in the organization is saying, hey, maybe we're not spending enough time planning our tasks so that when we get out of sprint planning, we still do planning along the way while we're trying to figure out how to implement the tasks as the sprint goes along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe instead of spending one hour in sprint planning per week, we should spend four hours like the book says. Mm -hmm. Right, and you shut down. And the, yeah, no, well, that's, well, that's, Here's that's, why. that's a ridiculous amount of time. How, four hours. That's a why whole half a day. That? How could I? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the scrum master. Well, the scrum master in that perspective could be like, well, well, actually, let's let's stop for a second. I understand what you're saying. We don't want to spend too much time uh, uh, having our developers outside doing non-development activities. But but let's think about this for a second. Maybe instead of one hour, maybe we can do two hours doing sprint planning and see if that makes a big difference and not having to go back into planning like, 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 to be the and counterpoint. they're interrupting and they're saying no and that's dumb and you're making too many changes yeah, why yeah, are you doing this yeah. guys right right yeah, yeah, yeah why is she doing this yeah 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 to be All like right. uh, that's a good example of but, conflict this is a good example <laughs> of uh, well hang on hang on why why are you so opposed to trying doubling the time box why are you so opposed to that? And right. you're shut down. You're you know. shut down. And then he got a crowd. This is all hypothetical. I'm just having fun with hypothetical. it. Hypothetical. I like it. I like it. And so what do you do after? That's what I want to get to. That's where I was trying to get to. How do you handle it after that interaction? Right? So I think people have handled it wrong. Right? Sometimes people will maybe like vent about it in the form of like gossiping. Maybe yeah. like bad mouthing the person because their ego was hurt. Yeah, that's not productive. That it's will probably not, cause yeah. other issues, right? Yeah. So in this instance, from what I understood, you want to have that conversation directly with the individual as soon as possible, right? You don't want too much time to elapse where it's forgotten. Maybe a day to simmer down, but you want to be direct with that person. But yeah, I want to ask you guys, what would you do? I think you're right, but I also think that when you have that conversation with that person. Tackle the problem, not the person. Tackle right? the problem, not the yeah. person. Tackle the problem because it, it, it's not you versus him or her. It is the idea, right? It's the idea. So going back to your point about the team just saying, why would you say that, blah, blah, blah. Right? Just, again, can we just try it one time mm -hmm. as an experiment? See how it works. We don't have to continue this if we don't like it. Let's just try it. And then that way, at least they get to try it one time. Mm-hmm. Right? That, so yeah, I'd just say that, tackle the problem, not the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always an instance, probably someone feels very closely aligned with the problem, right? Like identifying with the problem. So like, oh, you're saying the problem is me. But like you were mentioning, you avoid you statements. Right. You say we statements, you make sure they know we're in this together. Right. Why we're doing this, you, you mentioned the yeah. why behind it. I also wanna say that in almost every situation, you'd be able to look at the, if, especially if you're focusing on the problem, not the person, right? You'd be able to look at the problem and arrive at something you agree with them on, right? So if they say, well, we shouldn't be doing these events that are two hours long. Sure. Well, okay, so you agree that one hour is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. So you're agreeing with them that one hour is not enough, but you're also saying, okay, well, I'm not gonna force this two hour thing, but we're gonna try it as an experiment. We'll just try it one time. And if we get done in an hour and a half, great. Let's just try two though, right? Just We'll book the meeting for two hours, let mm -hmm. the team go mm -hmm. and see how long it takes them. How about that? If it, takes them, if it takes them an hour and a half, then in the future, we'll do another hour and a half. And if we find that's not enough, we can always go to two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So find something you agree with them on and then turn that around and say, so we are, we, we're not on, on opposite sides here, mm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're just trying to improve the process here in some way. That's a good way to diffuse the situation. What yeah. do you think, Brian? It'd be nice to get the product person on your side before continuing for the rest of these discussions. Cause like that, that goes a super long way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should be in the team. They should be treated like a team member. Right. I can come up with more hypotheticals if we want to keep yeah, going. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to talk through hypotheticals all night. Okay, one question I just thought of: 
how do you mentally prepare yourself to deal with this conflict? So in the situation we were just discussing, you wanted to have that one-on-one early. So maybe the next day you schedule a one-on-one, you make sure you're not discussing this with other people, you wanna have this conversation with them directly first. Mm-hmm. And then conflict for humans is usually uncomfortable. You know, they, they might get nervous in the conversation. So how would you think someone should mentally prepare to walk into this? I think that's an excellent question, first of all. You know, what I've done in the past, and I don't even know if this is the right thing to do, but it kind of sort of works. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were in person, I would basically find a small room get a flip chart and I would write in big letters what the problem is. Literally put the word problem, right? And Uh then alternate solutions from that problem. Just put them down, including the one you want them to pursue, plus the one that they're pushing for. Put them there, but Mm. also don't limit it to those two. It shouldn't be binary. Put in a couple of others. Even if you have none, just put something in there so that it can be knocked down, right? And then you bring them into the room and so you can still do this virtually. I just haven't had to, but you can do it virtually, right? Just put a mural, Miro, whatever it is that you use, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Notepad, doesn't matter. So when they come into the room, you say, so let's just look at the problem we're trying to solve here, right? So the focus is not that person anymore. It's the problem. They're coming in like this. Probably. What if the problem is them? <laughs> what if it is how they communicate? So then put that down as the problem is, <laughs> the way in which communication is taking place currently. Mm. And if it's between you and that person, I would say that. I would say the problem, the way the communication is taking place between us, Mm. right? Mm. Remember, there's no you still, it's us. Mm. Mm. Now the problem might be him, her, you, you. (laughs) just the you. Uh, A a big arrow that just, that's you. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the alternates there, in the extreme case, because either you leave or they leave, or are yeah, encouraged to leave, sure, right? I would put sure. that on the wall. I would just say, Scrum Master leaves, developer leaves, or whatever role they are, yeah. you know, leaves the yeah. team, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't use the word fired. I would just put that on there and say, these are possible outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about these. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. At what point would you involve HR? Would you, though? I've often seen if HR gets involved, it usually leads to the demise of one of the people being employed. Everyone. <laughs> I, like, it depends if HR is structured in a way where they are beneficiary to the teams. I personally would only go to the HR, regardless of what kind of HR I had, if I really had to, as a last resort, assuming that the relationship has turned toxic. Like the person has just uh, called you names yeah, or you know, sure. insulted you. I mean, any yeah. anything like that. It's like there's no there's uh, no call for yeah, that. Yeah, but in the situation you've just described, it's a you, he said, she said you that. would only go to HR if you expected HR is in the mindset where they're, they are serving the organizations rather than they're serving the executive team. Yeah. Because if the HR role is serving the executive team, And you come to them with a complaint of like, this person isn't working, this person is very combative, this person is very sexist, racist, literally whatever. But you are the person complaining. You are now the problem. That's right. So they think. Yeah, you're right. That happens all the time. Sure That happens all the time. That's why people have this saying, keep your head down, right? Keep your head down, stay low, don't cause any problems. Makes sense. Yeah, well, again, again, going back to the topics of the last podcast, I don't know if we said this in the last podcast, but I know we talked about it in the prep. When the HR rep of your company only works for the exec team, basically the only tool they have in their toolbox is a hammer. And <laughs> it looks like a nail. I don't know how we're hammering on this again. To, hey, yeah. It's topical, I guess. Uh, I guess. Is, it's well, it's we really not. Conflict. I mean, yeah. conflict in the workplace but, but, often involves HR. Yeah, but at, like as a scrum master, if you like, if you're like, well, I'm dealing with these people, and organizationally they're not being fair, and they're and I see where they're, I see where they are. I don't even want to say mistreating. Like, I, I I've been in development long enough to see a lot of mess up situations where HR probably should have gotten involved. Like a male development leads talking over a female team members where they would never talk that way to a male coworker. And it's like, how? That's the disrespect I was referring to in the Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen that quite a bit. Of 
course. Even being an outsider in that conversation, you were not even in the argument. You just happened to be at the table while the argument was happening. Should you serve as an outside perspective being like, hey, I saw this happen. Now we're back to what what I said is like, now you're seen as a problem. Correct. So now, yeah. So how much of a risk taker are you? Are you risk averse? If you're risk averse, you're probably going to say, well, let them figure it out. Yeah. It doesn't involve me. Yeah. Mm. If, if you're not, you might say, well, that's not right. Yeah. You know, mm. and, and you would take it to HR. And yes, you're taking the risk at that point. Yeah. It but depends you, on what, it's, what it's, your moral fiber tells you. Yeah. But I think if you've, if you've allowed it to go to that level where you're bringing somebody outside in, oh boy, this is going to be controversial. You've given up your ability to influence the situation. Your ability to influence that situation is in the moment. You should be backing up the, the, the argument that you're hearing to say, hey, wait a minute. You didn't seriously consider this person's opinion. Like, let's talk about that for a second. And that is where you can make, that is where you can have influence in the conversation it's not after the fact with the hr part because uh, again that's a complaint more it, than anything. no even if we say that the hr person is beneficial to the teams they are actively trying to help reduce conflict and, and and empower the teams to solve their own problems even if they are doing that you're still dealing with the problem after the fact where someone has to come in and they don't know which side to believe in. Like ah, somewhere between what Ohm says and what Jessica says is the truth. That's not always the case, it's, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. To your point, though, the, the the coaching moment is fleeting, the, right? Co- yeah, it's right. It's right yes. there, and you've yeah. got to hit it, right? Every right. time. But uh, but I would say a majority of the team would remember. Uh, again, I know we brought this up to say like. Does the scrum master have to always be the the bigger person in the room to be like, hey, right? let's all try to like, yeah. uh, spoiler, yes. Be- because everyone in the room will always remember the person who stopped the meeting to say, hey, like I understand you're saying we don't need to think about this, but do we really not need to think about it? Do you want to consider this person's opinion like, and actually talk about it again? Because everyone will remember like, oh, hey, Jessica said when Ohm brought up, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And Brian, who's a development manager or whatever, shot down. Ah, I don't want to talk about it. Well, I've made this decision. We don't want to, whatever. Well, let's move on. It's not important. I don't care about this. And and Jessica's like, mm, are you really sure you've considered all the options here? Let's just, just five minutes. I'm a, I'm a, I'll put five minutes on my watch. We'll just talk about it for five minutes just to make sure we've talked about it. I mean, you're already... You're already interceding in a contentious discussion yeah. for certain. Sure. But again, it goes back to the the reason you're using Scrum is like there's courage as one of the, you know what I mean? The, the courage to speak up is one of the fundamentals. What do they got? Principles? Fundamentals? I don't know. It, it's to say, hey, look, are you sure that this doesn't need to be discussed further? Are you really sure? So the Scrum Master should lead by example because the whole team is watching. You still might get shot down. You might. Uh, That's that, okay. You're talking to the right guy when it comes to losing <laughs> arguments. But uh, you've brought them up and reiterated and everybody on the teams, it's going to be in the front of their brain that you brought it back up to make sure that we talked about it. The funny thing about this is Jessica and I have worked with someone in the past where he would be the one to challenge the status quo to be like, hey, have you really thought about this or whatever? And the yeah. development manager or whatever at the time would be like, oh yeah, I did. And I don't care. And I don't want to do whatever. And then- he, Shut him down. He, yeah, we shut him down. And then he would bring up later, like you made this decision. And then we had to deal with this afterwards. And then the development manager, whoever made the decision would say, I never said that. And like I remember, like there were many, many situations where the person that we work with before would he'd be like, "What are you talking about? You totally made like we wrote in the story that we weren't gonna go down this road because you were assuming the risk, and we wrote in because you, we wrote in the comments your ticket or whatever. Like we wrote in the comments, we're not going to explore the risks of not doing something because in the meeting you said don't don't go down this path." And I, I can think of lots of discussions where I've been on the losing side of this. 
and uh, called it back into question. And the, the, the narcissist on the other side of the table has still been like, I never said that. Right. Must be you. Yeah, must be you. You're all crazy. And uh, since so that's I'm, legitimate conflict there. It, that's it a certainly problem. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like uh, there's conflict resolution, and then there's uh, dealing with narcissists, aka that's, sociopaths. That should be a oh, podcast man. on its own. That should yeah. be. Gosh, no, you were talking about that earlier before we went on air. About dealing with sociopaths. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because realistically, you don't want to go into conflict with those people. It's never going to turn out well. No, for you, you don't. Well. A narcissist? Well, the other thing about... They will about, never see it's your fault or their fault. Well, rather. separate dealing with sociopaths from dealing with narcissists because the sociopaths that I've worked with... That's right. I said that. The sociopaths that I've worked with have organized the organization around them. They've kind of firewalled themselves in the organization where they can say things without evidence and they can be insulated where it doesn't hurt them in the organization. So like, for example, like e evidence-based management doesn't hurt them because they've elevated themselves above like the product manager cycle to where the executives or whatever that they interact with, they don't interact on a peer level with the product managers. They only interact with the executive level. So they can say like, oh, well, I mean, Yes, we had some production outages, but it's not my fault. It's those uh, QA people. They didn't test enough or whatever. And if you go to talk to the product people, the, the product people have a completely different perspective. They'll be like, well, we were doing a bunch of risky stuff because the executives were pushing us and said that we had to get stuff done by a certain date and they wouldn't bend on the date. And mm. uh, we did things and they were risky and they crashed production because they just told us this is what we were doing and there was no pushback. And they just told us we had to do things. And regardless of us missing our tests or us failing certain tests to go to production or whatever, like if you're doing TDD or something like that, I'm like, oh, well, 75% of our tests passed, but 25% failed. And the 25% that failed is like critical stuff or whatever. But the VPs or whatever that promised dates said to push it out anyway, like that'll get left out of the conversation of course. Of course. at the level. You're right, right. So narcissists sociopaths or whatever, they have a way of insulating the conversations to different levels of the organization where they are protected and they can cast blame Something off them. That's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you identify that, what do you do, leave? Oh, if you can identify it and show evidence to different pieces of the organization, you've already figured out a way to work around it. You, you Usually sociopaths are really good at organizing a whole system around themselves. So whatever evidence you show, they'll have a counter to it. They'll, this goes back to what we talked about this. Oh, I don't like on one of the first podcasts you were on where I was talking about if I'm an executive and I make a decision based on logical, empirical evidence, that's one thing. But if you have me make a decision based on my gut feel, my emotional feel. So now I have to make a decision based on emotional feel versus empirical evidence, provable evidence. Which one wins out? Like logical evidence, data driven evidence, or the way I feel about something. So again, like going back to just, just the way I came up in development teams, the, the sociopaths on development teams are very good at exploiting your emotion based decisions mm. and negating any, uh, literally any logical evidence based management techniques. They're very good at that. Yeah. Some take it to an art form, as I say, you know, yeah. I mean, you got to admire them for yeah. that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And to come full circle with our conflict conversation. I like it. When in a conversation of conflict, it's probably a good idea to remove feelings from the conversation. I feel statements and maybe just stick to the facts of the situation. Yeah, absolutely you agree. can't argue facts. Yeah. yeah. Stick to the problem. Yeah. 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 Keep emotions out. Absolutely. Right. right. Yeah. Well, in 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 my particular case, in that organization, the technology people were very good at getting in front of the product people to the organization. The product people really never stood a chance because it was a technology organization that was trying to be a product-led organization. So the technology people were 
all always in front of the product people. Mm-hmm. The product people are trying to break in and become at the forefront of the technology, but it wasn't that way when I was with that organization. Sometimes it, it's just not possible, depending on the personalities involved in the organization. I think that's valid. Yeah. And that's something that you have to learn over time. I yeah. mean, oh, val- that valid wisdom. and also terrible. Like a valid, but terrible. It's you know, like running a successful business under that model. How are you going to do that? Mm-hmm. You don't care about evidence. You don't care about how many. You're basically saying, I don't care about how much I spend to produce a product versus how much revenue the product gains for me. You, that's basically what you're saying. I think you don't care. Describe some major car manufacturers. You're not wrong, <laughs> but I mean, like, like how long can you run the business with that? Like, oh, I feel like we're doing great. I feel we're gonna be awesome next year mm-hmm. until like there's literally no money left. Right. Yeah, uh, that's not a long term strategy for sure. Yeah, hope is not a long term strategy. No, that's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, to wrap conflict up, I'm trying to think about what I heard today. So one, if you're in the conversation, encourage a break. Right. I liked that. I thought that was that was good. So mm-hmm. maybe walk outside. Everyone take a break. Right. Uh, you can say something like, mm, let's take this offline and continue yeah. the conversation another time. So those were good points. We also mentioned that after the conversation, we can schedule a one on one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, in that conversation, we avoid you statements. We stick to facts, avoid emotion, mm-hmm. focus on the problem at hand. Yeah, and then probably, and we didn't mention this, but probably focus on some action steps afterward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the other thing is that we said, just make sure the problem's visible. Right? Yeah. Because if, if you visible. don't have anything to focus your eyes and the other person's eyes on, then they're focused on one another. Yeah. And you then forget about the problem. You start to get into personalities at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing I wish we went into, and it might be too late, what happens when someone just starts digging out that personality of the other person? Yeah, we just keep orienting them to the problem. Redirect. If you have it displayed, right, then you could say, can we agree that this is the problem we're trying to solve? Forget about the mm-hmm. solutioning part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can we agree on the problem? That's good. Right? Yeah. So you start off the bat, even if you agree on the problem and nothing else, You've started off by agreeing with them on something, mm-hmm. and that's always mm-hmm. a good. It's always a good entry into solving the problem because it's basically starting with ground that you've given. Mm-hmm. They feel you've given some ground, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's always a good way to negotiate. Mm-hmm. The politicians do this all the time, especially mm-hmm. when they negotiate global with other countries. Basically, right? Mm-hmm. They always go into it with something to give. They know they're going to have to yield a little. And some people are very effective at that. They'll just go in and say, right off the bat, this is all I can give you. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So right off the bat, if I come in and say, Brian, I, let's solve this problem. I'm willing to give you this, but that's all I can give you. He's got to feel good about that. Sure. Because he hasn't done anything to get that. I'm, right. I'm just giving that. I'm surrendering. That's right. Mm. I saw Hamilton. I know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, guys. And then we also mentioned we should observe. We should observe who we're dealing with. Are they a sociopath? Are they a narcissist? If so, we're going to have to deal with this a different way. Maybe it isn't to deal with it at all. We know like right. we can't get through to this person. It will be emo- emotionally, energetically exhausting to do so. Yeah. So at that point, you can leave the organization, it sounds like. And maybe worst case scenario, bring this up to HR. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say uh, burn their house down or something like that. It's like a worst case scenario. I was going to say poison their coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But, but you're right. Talking to HR, yeah, worst case scenario. Yeah, you're right. I agree. So we covered a lot of ground today, so thanks for hanging with us, yeah. everybody. Both of you. Yeah. It was a good topic, and then it became weird. We went off to a weird place. I feel that was mostly me. And uh, we went super long on this. Like, I'm I'm kind of shocked at how long we went on this. And I, we could have gone longer. You know, one thing I didn't ask, it's too late now, we wrapped up. Hey. But one thing I didn't ask was, what happens after the one-on-one? Like, how do you measure success of that one-on-one? Cause that's a whole nother, that's a whole oh, yeah. nother podcast, one-on-ones. That's the podcast. One-on-ones is the podcast. All right, cool. This is a great topic. Thanks for playing.